I'm Daniel Bass, manager of the South Asia program at Cornell University. And I'm Shavin Senevaratna, graduate student in architecture at Cornell and student worker at the South Asia program. Welcome back to season two of the Next Monsoon podcast, where we'll be featuring interviews recorded during the conference alongside some snippets of conference presentations. Our first guest this episode is Farhan Karim, one of the panelists at the conference. He is an architectural historian, originally from Bangladesh, who did his doctoral work in Australia before becoming a professor in the U.S. Here's Farhan Karim. Uh, I am Farhan, Farhan Karim. I'm an associate professor now teaching at the Arizona State University. Welcome to the Next Monsoon Podcast. Okay. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here with you to, today. So what have been some of your takeaways from the conference so far? The conference is really... Um, interesting because uh, on the one hand it brings together a group of scholars who are working on similar topic but from a very different perspective from a very, very different um, angles mm-hmm. so uh, some of us are kind of you know uh, it gets an opportunity and scope for us to reflect on our own work and um, uh, uh, kind of reassessing what we have been doing methodologically mm-hmm. and content wise and and I think that's the wonderful thing about this conference bringing together an interdisciplinary group of scholars mm-hmm. yeah. what would you say is distinct about the research in South Asia done by all interdisciplinary scholars in the conference okay that's an interesting question <laughs> um, I think that South Asia Look, there's two different things that is happening in South Asia. Number one, that um, in a broader sense, South Asia is a big ecological unit chunk, Mm -hmm. meaning that there has been so much overlapping between uh, the the lands and forests. We are sharing the rivers. So that has its own unique inner working and ecology. But on the other hand, lines of division Mm -hmm. between the nation states, the boundaries, that is, in a sense, um, relatively opaque and impermeable, you know. So this is, uh, you know, th- this creates a uh, lots of challenge when it comes comes to, I mean, that implementation of any, I mean, cross boundary or regional level policy implementation in South Asia, and mm-hmm. that also makes our, I mean, that as a researcher, our work quite different and um, challenging. Because we have to navigate through this uh, political political challenge. What presentations have caught your attention, and, and that's, what topics interest you so far? I mean that all of these papers has uh, unique in its own way. But, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but being an architect, I'm always interested in the making side of mm. um, of, of any paper. I mean that there are papers that is documentation of the human experience, mm-hmm. the documentation of the experience of the you know climate migrants or climate refugees or climate climate displaced people. So there's works like that, but there are some papers that actually. Um, trying to to mitigate the climate crisis through making like Mm. uh, through creating products or to redesigning the urban fabric or how to re-envision the areas where the climate migrants came and Mm -hmm. eventually settle in Mm -hmm. so I was like really um, interested in that kind of paper being an architect in the in the making side of of these you know uh, papers To highlight an example of research that documents the human experience which Farhan was interested in, we're next bringing you Rohit Mujumdar's presentation from the conference. Rohit is an architect and urban planner who teaches at the School of Environment and Architecture in Mumbai. His paper is titled, Architectures of Exfoliation, Unmaking Urban Lives and Ecologies. A first series of ripples were felt in March 22, um, when the Mumbai Climate Action Plan was publicly unveiled as a vision for a net zero future city of 2050. I'll make just one comment on it. In the aesthetics of its analysis, weather change has a recent history, but its society is ahistoric. 
A second series of ripples followed as the traveling exhibition Critical Zones broke on Mumbai's shores in October 2022. This station for observation unraveled scientific concepts and data using artistic methods, combining statistics, cartographies, still and moving images, digital stories, text and installation. So climate change action expertise has advanced on the one hand rational planning and on the other hand eidetic approaches to these two examples. In spite, despite their differences, they are however conjoined at the roots in advancing templates, models and toolkits of scientific expertise that circulate globally. The circulation of such expertise ignores the expertise of Mumbai's urban majority to endure and adapt to the changing weather. They also weaken the claims of the urban majority by drowning them out in the formalized procedures of expert planning and the announcement of ecological emergencies. Now, so I ask in this presentation, how do majority households experience and innovate their responses to monsoon's everyday wetness and its extreme events in the making of and unmaking of urban life and ecologies. I went with a semi-structured interview questionnaire wanting to study oral histories of households and how do they speak about their experiences of living and enduring the monsoon's weather. The, I went in search for vulnerabilities and risks that household face, households face, and the potential for resilience and adaptation. In the language of conversations that unfolded with our interlocutors, from household to household, I came to learn one very important thing, the very different language being spoken at the grassroots. As life foliates and exfoliates, so does build form. And it is this uh, formulation that I kind of came to learn from the language that, how, language that households use in talking about how their lives and the built forms that they live in transforms, becomes the centerpiece of exploring uh, uh, architectural concept in this work. So as against future-proofing cities from the vantage point of, uh, vantage of a tipping point in the near or distant future of climate change, at stake in this question and architectures of exfoliation lies a challenge to advance an epistemology of multiplicity and spatial politics in the meantime of weather change as against the tipping point. Uh, as cities seek to put climate change action plans and infrastructures in place. I explore this question in neighborhoods of Mumbai's lesser talked about Daisa River and Gorai Creek wetscapes, whose intricate coastline to an extent can only be visible in historical maps today. This coastline extended from Adivasi Padas, located at the foot, foot of the Sanjay Gandhi National Park, where Daisa River and its rivulets traversed agricultural lands, Gautans, which are urban villages, and Koliwadas, fishing villages, and met with Gorai Creek to form a wide inlet for the ingress and egress of seawater. Significant portions of these marshes, mud flats, were drained of their wetness and filled in since the 1950s to implement many kinds of um, um, build form layouts. Cooperative housing societies on private or state plotted town planning schemes, chawls and bastis on non plot layouts, Adivasi padas on forest land, and Koliwadas and Gautans, all with very tenure and legal conditions comprise this wetscape. I will present vignettes from the oral histories that have been involved in gathering from households in two tenure conditions. First from a chawl slash basti on, in, in a non-plotted layout and in, on environmental commons. And second from an Adivasi Pada in the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. The latter is a case that I added yesterday after uh, hearing many of the conversations. So I may not have 
enough time to get into the depth of it, but I'll, I'll kind of speak about it very briefly. Um, so I'll get into the first case. During the 1950s, Ambawadi neighborhood in the Daisa River wetscape was inhabited by a North Indian community who reared cows in cattle sheds. Following the establishment of RA Milk Cooperative in the Sanjay Gandhi National Park during the 1950s, Ambawadi's cattle shed owners anticipated a financial opportunity in Mumbai's increasing housing demand. Their cattle sheds began to transform during the 1960s as the cattle shed owners built and rented single room tenements to low income migrants. The drawing captures here the life space of the neighborhood in two moments of time, the 1960s and 2010s, to show how the built form of large cattle sheds organized around narrow finger-like paths leading to a river edge gave way to small tenements in this basti organized as chores. A shopkeeper residing in Mumbai's central suburbs had to retire from his utensil-making business due to a paralytic attack. His household migrated to Mumbai's western suburbs after purchasing an apartment during the early 1970s. Following his wife's demise during the early 1980s, he sold this apartment and moved with his son into a tenement in Ambawadi that he had purchased. In migrating northwards, he envisioned that the savings resulting from the difference between the sale and purchase value of the tenements will help him to live his life out and educate his son. More importantly, he purchased the tenement in Ambawadi after finding out that several Gujarati-speaking households, his linguistic community, were inhabiting other tenements in the neighborhood. And um, I mean, one can kind of go through the drawings in detail, but one point to make over here, a small kitchen was retrofitted on the wall facing the street where everyday routines of washing and socializing unfolded amongst other households. In the mid 2000s, a household consisting of a married couple and their young son rented the next door tenement from the cattle shed owner who had become a developer of many such jobs. They belonged to the same linguistic community as their neighbor. The woman worked in a beauty parlor while building her own independent clientele, her husband worked as an Ola cab driver with his own car. By this time, a mezzanine loft was retrofitted in their neighbor's house. The internal walls were tiled up to the lintel level, that's up to the window, uh, the upper level of the window. Right outside their tenements, a channel to drain the grey water produced by washing clothes and utensils was constructed when the local corporator's funds were invested to pave the street. Within another dec decade, the disabled shopkeeper had retrofitted a toilet cum bath in his tenement. The beautician's household only retrofitted a bath in their house. The different retrofit designs owe to their particular demands made by the household configurations, one shaped by the imperatives of disability and the other by gender in a neighborhood inhabited by several single male migrant residents. These retrofits were constructed soon after the municipal sewage pipe connection was extended to the public toilet through the corporator's funds. The now grown up son of the disabled shopkeeper stays at home taking responsibility for their household chores, while the beautician's, sons work, beautician's son works part-time in a hotel completing an undergraduate degree in commerce. He aspires to immigrate abroad after completing a diploma in hotel management. The Chawl has transformed over the last 50 years from being inhabited largely by single male migrant labor to one that is inhabited by nuclear or joint family households living in owned or rented tenements. In some cases, households who have purchased the house also rent the mezzanine loft to other households or single migrant men. The designs to retrofit tenements not only reflect their household choices uh, and configurations, but also their perceptions of property tenure. <clears throat> 
Monsoon's dampness permeate, permeates their tenement walls into the winter, leading to fungal, moss, mold growth and bed bug and termite attacks along with the odor of dampness. The cycle repeats year after year. The walls of the tenement remain damp through the year, up to at least two feet from the ground. Dampness also leads to allergies and respiratory disease, especially in young children. These households spend approximately 75 to 100 uh, US dollars each year to paint walls, repair and mend things that have become weaker and clean residues due to monsoon's everyday week, uh, wetness. The disabled shopkeeper remembers instances of flooding in the settlement in 1998, 2005, 2008, and 2017. In other cases, households remember flooding instances going back to 1965 in the same kind of neighborhood. In an event of flood, water enters tenements with a force that can not only affect the structure, but also carries with it sludge, debris, and biotic and other abiotic substances that accumulate in the tenement. Sorry. In such instances, inhabitants of these tenements shift onto the mezzanine loft or find refuge on the terraces of public toilets. During extreme events, as in the case of the 2005 flood, nearby missionary schools ended up opening their halls and classrooms for the tenements res res residents to live in, while religious institutions come came to provide food and clothing. When households have to employ labor for cleaning, repair, and mending of the tenement due to the instances of flooding, the cost can rise up to 300 US dollars, a significant financial implication. The anticipation of a flood event has different gendered implications. Working women in the settlement, such as the beautician, usually stay back at home and miss work in order to keep a watch on the children, belongings, and valuables from being washed away. Men usually perform this role at night, where rotating duties are assigned to male members in the community to monitor the rise of water in stormwater drains. The stormwater drains act as an information system for the sign of flooding. When water rises in the stormwater drains, you come to know that probably there will be flooding. The possibilities for retrofitting of a mezzanine loft allow such tenements to function to the rhythms of monsoon cyclical time. Mezzanine lofts reduce the heat transfer to the lower levels during summer, where the house is lived uh, in during the summers. In anticipation of the monsoon, valuables and other household goods are stored on the mezzanines and space is made to live in anticipation of a flood. One observes four instances of cyclical change in the yearly activities to gear the space of the tenement for the change in the seasons. And uh, material practices that come to kind of transform the tenement built form weave into and situr the intersections of the linear time of life spaces and the cyclical time of weather. This include the retrofitting of mezzanine lofts, raising of roofs, the tiling of walls, a new affinity towards wrought iron, plastic, and in situ stone of, or cement concrete furniture. These are not only outcomes of household practices to live and endure with monsoon's wetness in the tenement, but also a marker for the household social status in the chalk. Each stage of the spatial transformation of this built form or these ten, in these tenements could be read through formal processes such as layering, folding, shedding, fission, fusion, which I have come to term here as the architectures of exfoliation, borrowing and drawing on the analogy from disciplines of physical geography, geology, biology, and mathematics. I won't get into the discussion of how it is kind of drawn into uh, the specifics of it, of how one draws it within the discipline of architecture that requires a separate discussion. But what I want to get at is that this is a pervasive practice in wetscapes of Mumbai across different kinds of land tenure conditions. For instance, over here, a terrace garden retrofitted in a dense gauton, an urban village, which not only acts as a space for leisure and exercise, but also a space for taking refuge during the floods. Apartment typologies 
comparatively present lesser spatial affordances to adapt during extreme events of the monsoon. And usually those kinds of types which are considered to be uh, types that need to be kind of demolished and newer building apartments rebuilt turn to be more innovative uh, than uh, the apartment type that is kind of valorized in architectural uh, imagination. We probably need to move beyond thinking in terms of mirror images. That's where architectures of exfoliation comes into play. That was Rohit Mujumdar from the School of Environment and Architecture in Mumbai speaking at the next Monsoon Conference at Cornell in October 2023. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear his examples of how people started to take matters in their own hands and configure spaces to cater to their everyday needs. And such an informal way of altering space and adapting to climate conditions that definitely isn't super common in Western um, architecture and practice. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of this conference is bringing people from all over the world and their different perspectives and research mm. experiences. And I found how he talked about the power of moisture, which is such a recurring theme that you'll hear about this season when discussing yeah. the monsoon, which is all about an abundance of moisture, um, but especially in the wetscapes of Mumbai, which is a city built on land, reclaimed from water. Mm -hmm. It's on the water's edge. It's facing threats of climate change because of its coastal position. And so the power of water as this kind of impending mm -hmm. doom and so on and like threat that needs to be managed was uh, quite fascinating. That's it for today's episode of The Next Monsoon. Next time, we'll be talking to urban planner and architect Ruhith Mujumdar, whose presentation you just heard, as well as geography professor at University of Colorado Boulder, Emily Ye, for their takes on the conference. We'll also be sharing snippets of a unique presentation by artist and writer Parasmitha Singh titled, If You Want Water, Be Prepared for Pipe Burst. The pipe burst! <laughs> Add that sound effect there. We would like to give special thanks to Sam Lubowitz and Angelica Kramer at Cornell's Language Resource Center for their assistance with recording this podcast. Shavin Senavaratna not only co-hosts this podcast, but is also our editor. South Asia Program Administrator Gloria Lemus Chavez provided production supervision. Funding for this podcast and the entire Next Monsoon Project comes from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please follow the South Asia Program on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at SAP Cornell. You've been listening to music by Gloria Lemus Chavez and her partner Brandon Kane. Make sure to check out more of their work in the description links below. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast do not reflect those of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Cornell's Office of the Vice Provost for International Affairs, or any other official entity of Cornell University. I'm Daniel Bass. And I'm Shavin Senevratna. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode for new conversations and stories on the next monsoon.